Welcome to another video on the fossil record. My name is Benjamin Berger and in this video I want to explore how did mammals, a group so successful and widespread today, were actually nearly driven to extinction during the early Mesozoic, during the age that saw the rise of the dinosaurs instead. I want to explore a neglected period of mammalian evolution during the Triassic period and why dinosaurs rather than mammals came to dominate the earth for so long in the following Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. As humans, we are the only intelligence in the known universe. Our own path toward existing you know, kind of should have been a cakewalk, a, a breeze, something that was bound to happen on Earth. But I don't necessarily think this was the case. And often we don't account for the amazing amount of luck and chance that it took for us to be here now. The Drake equation is a seemingly simple mathematical expression that attempts to calculate the possibility of intelligent life existing in the universe somewhere. It was developed in 1961 by Frank Drake as a method to estimate the number of extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations. The R star of this expression is the rate of star formation. This is a gigantic number in the trillions and trillions, with Fp is the number of those uh, stars, a uh, fraction of those stars, with planets. So this is actually a pretty large percentage of those trillions of stars have planets. Ne is the number of those planets that could support life. That's a smaller number, but it's still pretty enormous. FL is the number of those planets that actually develop life, which is much smaller fraction. But the next few expressions of this equation, FI and FC, are the fractions of planets that develop an intelligent life form that is able to send out communications to reach other planets. What are these expressions and how likely is it that intelligence originates on a planet from a simple form of life, like a, a single-celled bacterium? Now, if we use Earth and its um, fossil record as a way to estimate this chance, this, this possibility, there's something that's always struck me. The pathway to intelligence is anything but guaranteed. So as the fossil record documents, there is this incredibly long and rocky road in which our own lineage had to endure to get to this point in history. To being able to watch a YouTube video in the comfort of your own home with the intelligence to understand language. So was this a one in a million, maybe a one in a billion chance, or one in a trillion chance, or was it something even less? This factor, this parameter, is the one that affects the outcome of the Drake equation more than any other, and yet we really don't have a method to determine this unknown value. But the longer I've been studying the fossil record, um, the more that I've come to accept that these parameters are probably toward the lowest range, maybe one in a trillion uh, chance. Uh, the development of high intelligence was not inevitable, and no prediction <laughs> uh, could have been made that our early mammal ancestors would go on to success millions of years later. A really good example of this in the rock record is the events of the Triassic um, and how our lineage narrowly escaped extinction twice. Our own lineage was not, was almost nearly wiped out. It was kind of hanging in there on a thin string. It was like this little relic population of animals that somehow, somehow survived 
this long time of chaos on the Earth. Now, the Triassic period is the first uh, period of the Mesozoic, the age of the dinosaurs, and it, which saw the rise of dinosaurs during the Triassic Carnian age. Um, the Triassic period, however, is bracketed by two of Earth's worst mass extinction events. The end Permian mass extinction event that was 252 million years ago that ushered in the extremely hot and barren early Triassic world and the end Triassic mass extinction at 200 million years ago that ended with another global warming event and the breakup of the great um, supercontinent of Pangaea. The, the Triassic period lasted from 252 to 200 million years. That's 52 million years. That's a length of time that's it's kind of nearly as long as from now to the time of Tyrannosaurus Rex. It was this long period in Earth's history which saw this major transformation of life on the planet. It was an extremely harsh world with, uh, filled with vast sand deserts, uh, major monsoonal systems of kind of intense weather, um, and a barren landscape that was kind of nearly devoid of vegetation. The slow recovery of life on the planet, which was on the verge of being wiped out for good, it was, it was basically a post-apocalyptic world, and one in which the survival of a group of furry mammals would prove that despite it all, intelligence, I guess, could evolve in the universe. The lineage leading to mammals during the earlier Permian period was part of a larger kind of cast of characters, which all featured the single temporal opening in the skull. These reptile-like animals are called the synapsids or synapsida, and many of them looked more reptilian than mammals. And during the Permian period, they were the dominant form on land with such icons as Dimetriodon and Edaphiosaurus. But over time, most of these went extinct. A few members of the Synapsida as a group were actually able to survive the first major mass extinction event and make it through the the death and destruction at the onset of the Triassic. These disaster taxa, including Lystrosaurus, rising from the ashes of the first major extinction event. Lystosaurus is a member of a group of synapsid reptiles called dicynodonts, which featured two front cusps on their skulls. Dicynodonts would prove to be a clear choice for the next group to inherit the world, and several genera had actually made it through Earth's nastiest extinction event. This is Lystosaurus, um, Myosaurus, Combustia. These kind of dog-sized animals quickly branched into um, larger cow and even rhino-sized monsters during the Triassic. The most successful were grouped into the Canamyiformes. Canamyria, the type genus of this group, uh, was a fairly large animal and featured these characteristic massive tusk-like upper canine teeth. Um, and some of the strongest jaw muscles for crunching down on vegetation. These animals feasted on the horsetails and ferns, which were limited to the wetter regions of the earth in a world without grasses or other flowering plant, plants for nutrition. These scattered pockets of vegetation proved a really good source of nutrients and food for these mobile monsters. As fully terrestrial animals roaming from veggie patch to veggie patch to the next, these were the first kind of behemoths for the time. Um, with few predators to worry about, their slow plantigrade feet were adequate to outrun predators like Erathosuchus, which were a sprawling crocodile-like animal. But things were about to change starting around 230 million years ago. Those uh, crocodilian-like animals would become much quicker 
and more agile predators with the appearance of animals like Herrerasaurus. These animals were bipedal, they were swift, with an open acetabulum that allowed running limbs that quickly moved them from place to place across the vast areas of open space. These were the true dinosaurs. As dinosaurs became more agile and able to hunt the Dicynodonts, the Dicynodonts as a group adapted to these dinosaurs by becoming much larger in size. And toward the end of the Triassic period, these great survivors had become enormous beasts with the genus Lesothowicchia, a rhino or elephant-sized animal that roamed ancient Poland. These dicynodonts were not as taxonomically diverse uh, in the second half of the Triassic, as their total species diversity kind of decreased with time. The well-known Placeras from the Chinle Formation, a late Triassic dicynodont, um, although up to 30% of some fossil quarries, is really represented by only a few genera during the entire Norian age of the Triassic, and a smaller component of the total fauna compared with diapsid reptiles like um, dinosaurs and dinosaur relatives. Now the large size of the Dicynodons kind of helped to fend off the dinosaurs, but this strategy well, it had its problems. It required both quick growth and an abundance of food, so the group was bound for extinction during the next big event at the end of the Triassic period, the, the group was not so lucky this time around. The Dicynodonts, they were gone. Although there are reports of Dicynodonts discovered from younger rock, rock layers, none have really proven true, and the group appears to have died out right at the end of the Triassic. So the great disaster taxa, the Dicynodonts, were not able to pass through the next major mass extinction, the next catastrophic event, the, the end Triassic event. However, they were not the only synapsid to have survived the end Permian mass extinction. There was another group hidden during the Triassic, which is the group that I actually kind of want to talk about the most today, the Cynodonts and their survival during the Triassic. It's the lineage that leads to me, to you, to us humans, as well as to all living mammals. This is Thraxodon, your ancient, ancient ancestor, the mother of all mammals, a survivor of the greatest mass extinction the world has ever seen. Thraxodon features traits that made it a remarkable survivor. Unlike the Dicynodonts, Thraxodon did not just have the two big canine tusks, but a full row of teeth, with incisors in front, large cane, dagger like canines, and crushing teeth or molar like teeth in the back of the jaw. The single temporal opening flanged out into a zygomatic arch, allowing big chewing muscles like the temporalis and masseter, and even had a post-orbital bar enclosing the eye socket. It was about the size of a fox, but it was adapted to living underground, a burrowing animal. It had these strangely thickened ribs and strong bony projections, or zygopophyses, extending from the dorsal vertebrae to give this animal a great deal of strength along its back preventing it from being crushed inside a burrow underground. The ribs also facilitated enlarged intercostal muscles that allowed for effective breathing, an important requirement for an animal that lived underground in an environment with too much carbon dioxide, a poorly ventilated burrow. These respiratory traits allowed the animal to survive the harsh atmosphere of the early Triassic and navigate through the mass extinction within a fallout shelter underground. 
There's even evidence that Thraxodon had whiskers to navigate the dark tunnels it dug, and maybe even a body covered in fur. Unlike the Dicynodonts, the Cynodonts looked more mammal and were on the lineage toward us. But Thraxodon had a long way to go. It still had to face another major extinction, as well as new predators with the coming of predatory dinosaurs to avoid. After making it through the mass extinction at the beginning of the Triassic period, Thoraxodon began to spread out across the world. Uh, members of the Cynodonts found in Africa, they've been found in Asia, North America, and Europe. Um, by the early Triassic period, the group split into two major lineages. The older group are called the Cynathia, and they include the type genus Cynathus. Cynathus is a larger predatory version of Thoraxodon. Um, with more expanded uh, zygomatic arch for impressive crushing sharp teeth and a thick postorbital enclosure of the eye socket. So this new world it afforded this animal to move out of the burrow and into active hunting on the open ground of the early Triassic. It measured over a meter in length and exhibited a unique feature of a secondary palate which enclosed the mouth uh, from the nasal passage, allowing the animal to drink and breathe at the same time, as well as a diaphragm, traits that likely shared with its ancestor, Thoraxodon. Cygnathus, however, still had a fairly primitive pelvis that resembled its synapsid ancestors, with a wide a blade-like ilium that resembles a crocodile or, or reptile pelvis, um, with slower sprawling or crawling like locomotion. In life, it would have uh, resembled the back and forth gait of a large lizard. While a predator, it was still rather slow covering ground, but most other animals during this period were you know, slow as well. The Cygnathid as a group began to push toward increasing their running abilities by increasing the depth of the acetabulum with a deeper articulation with the femur, as well as lengthening the ilium into a blade to support more muscles. All this provided better extension or retraction of the upper leg or thigh. The shift is slight, but seen in some specimens of Dimediodon and the late Macedonathus. In fact, these features of the pelvis were to become a major innovation we would see in later mammals. With the ilium projecting more anteriorly and the ischium more posteriorly, with the pelvis positioned higher against the sacrum, the major muscles of the upper leg would support a swinging sagittal motion, giving the animals a much more upright gait and ability to run even faster with the femur directly below the animal rather than on the side. The coevolution of pelvic muscles and bones in both dinosaurs and mammals is an example of the Red Queen hypothesis, where two groups must run faster and faster, chasing each other in order to stay in the same place, to basically coexist together. So dinosaurs and mammals were both in this race and they greatly modified their pelvis bones and muscles to facilitate faster running abilities throughout the Triassic period. Macetonathus is a well-known member of the Synathid group with several great skeletons known from the Carnian age of the Triassic. It features rows of flatter teeth which were used in the eating of plants rather than a strict diet of meat as its ancestors. Maschionathus featured um, eyes that project forward, uh, giving the animal stereoscopic vision and the ability to determine depth. It was a unique trait for a herbivore, which also had to be on the lookout for early dinosaurs, which had evolved by this time.
The temporal opening for the jaw muscles was massive, with enormous muscles for chewing. These herbivores were placed within a family called the Travisodontidae, and they were successful during the middle part of the Triassic period, a world in which they had to face the newly emerging dinosaurs like Hararasaurus. One genus, Exoratodon, featured a skull like a turtle-like skull along a long rib-filled body. Such traits resemble some of the features of crocodilians or turtles, and the teeth were flat, providing broad surfaces for chewing vegetation. The cynathids as a group were not very brainy. Their skulls show much more attention to jaw muscles than an area for a brain. The narrow brain case is so very narrow that it's hard to think that this group was doing much intelligent thinking. By the end of the Triassic period, the Cygnathids were about to face the next major extinction, but already they were looking a rather odd and a little scrappy. The late Triassic genus Scathiodontids was fairly large, getting into the range of a cow-sized animal and featuring, featuring big, robust bones and enormous peg-like teeth. And specimens are known from Madagascar called Metadon, and they feature a pretty mammal-like pelvis, a more upright gait, but still kind of big peg-like teeth. But there were a few smaller forms also known. The Travis Daunted family was heading into the late Triassic as a possible survivor for the next great extinction, but things begin to go bad for them. As the end Triassic mass extinction ended, this great line of mammals uh, was also wiped out. So this left only one other group. It's an earlier split from the Cygnathids. These were the Probanonathians. The type genus of this group is known in the later Triassic, the Carnian Age, Probanonathus. In fact, Probanonathus is found alongside some of the early ancestors to dinosaurs, like Lagosuchus and Merosuchus. But before we get to some of the bigger predatory dinosaurs, like Herrerasaurus. Unlike the Dicynodonts and other Synathians, the Probathianathians were much smaller, about the size of rats and it might be best to consider them as the rats of the Triassic. One of the most amazing things about the pro is their larger brain size and their enormous big eyes. They may have even been nocturnal insect-eating animals that required low vision light and more complex insectivore-like teeth. Their jaws have rows of teeth with tiny cusps, and the premaxilla is greatly enlarged, with their canines appearing further back in the jaw. Probathianathians had a lot going for them compared to other groups. They had a larger brain, they were smaller, and they may have only come out at night. Hence, as dinosaurs took over in the late Triassic period, these animals were able to lurk and scatter away from the larger predatory dinosaurs. However, there were some things going against the Probathenathians. The first is their rather limited geographic range. While the other groups were more cosmopolitan, the vast majority of Probathenathians are restricted to South America during the Triassic period. A few are found in Africa during the Triassic. But it wasn't until 2020 in which a probable probathignathid was found in North America during the Triassic, a genus named Catagiodon from the Norian Age Chin Li Formation in the American Southwest, as these fossils are really rare outside of South America. Most of what we know about the probathignathids comes from the fossil record of the late Triassic Santa Maria Formation of Brazil. 
And it's an incredible rock layer that not only preserves some of the oldest dinosaurs like Nathovorax and Saturnella and Therachiosaurus, but a diverse fauna of Probathianathians. One of the most amazing recent discoveries was a beautiful skull of a Probathianathid called Prozacthriodon. It was found just inches away from a maxilla of a predatory carnivore dinosaur, Nathavorax, showing the early association between dinosaurs and mammals. Prozothriodon had lost its postorbital bar with an open eye socket with the lower temporal opening. This is a feature that you see in many modern mammals, as well as very wide zygomatic arches and still a rather small brain case. The post canine teeth are really unique in having a series of cusps, up to four cusp teeth, arranged in a row, which is sometimes referred to as a triconodont condition, which is seen in later Jurassic mammals. The fossil fauna of the Santa Maria Formation of Brazil is really a critical time in the success of this group, as they had to contend with the new, quicker dinosaurs and adapt to these new creatures. Toward the end of the Triassic, Probathianathians would split into two major groups, which are best known in the aftermath of the end Triassic extinction, as both groups make it through this second extinction event. This would set up a very deep division within later mammals, and it all has to do with their teeth. Triassic probathinathids are unique in having multiple cusps on their post canine teeth most of the time in kind of a row of three major cusps, although some had more. This is not so different than what we have in some diapsid reptiles actually do. They have multiple cusps to help slice and cut vegetation and meat. Cusps are not found in animals that do not chew or crush their food. Having the ability to both slice and crush food would give later mammals an important superpower to make them effective eaters. Dinosaurs would have to glomp down big bites of food and swallow it whole. Primitive mammals could actually spend the time and chew their food. And this was achieved near the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, but done differently in two groups that arose during this period of time. One group took the row of cusps on their teeth and basically copied it into multiple rows of cusps. This multi-cusp arrangement looks like a meat tenderizer built to crush food that had been sliced by the anterior teeth. And like a meat tenderizer, these rows of cusps interlocked into a great surface to smash bites of food into smaller pieces before swallowing, using a front-to-back motion or paddle jaw stroke that characterizes the, this entire group. The earliest of these multi-cusp mammals are called the Tritiliodontidae, which are a mysterious group of mammal-like animals, the best known of which is Oligoclyphus. Oligoclyphus was a small animal that is found in the late Triassic and actually survived into the early Jurassic. And while it featured many of the traits of the probathic nathids, it took some novelty in the teeth being multi-cusped and featuring a long diastema or gap in the jaws and procumbent anterior incisor teeth. It was the first animal that was adapted to crack and break open seed bearing cones, as well as tough vegetation that other animals avoided. This adaptation allowed the animal to survive the end Triassic mass extinction where the others had failed. Oligoclyphus is often considered an early modern mammal relative, but is not considered a true mammal because the ear bones, those little bones in the middle ear, the air filled chamber, the Incus, Stapes, and Malleolus, were yet to really appear in form. Instead, 
Oligo Cliffus had a external acoustic meatus that was closely associated with the lower jaw, and that the jaw joint was not between the dentary and squamosal bones, but exhibited the reptilian condition. This is where things get a little murky for me regarding the late Triassic and early Jurassic tritiliodonts. Most modern interpretations suggest that the group made it through the end Triassic boundary just fine, with some success in the early Jurassic, like the well-known Chiantotherium, but that the group was uh, doomed shortly afterward with extinction, sometime disappearing and sometime in the early Jurassic period. What we know of the Tritiliodontids is that they appear to have given um, birth to a large number of offspring, possibly with numerous eggs or even live birth. They're not considered true mammals, and they're often neglected from discussions of mammal evolution. However, I want to offer an older idea, a little bit more uh, radical of an idea. This idea I call radical because it's not followed by many workers today. This idea hypothesizes that the tritylodontids are the group that give rise to a series of highly successful Mesozoic mammals, including the Hyamayids, the Multituberculates, the Gondwanatherians, and are even alive today with monotremes as descendants of the Gondwanatheres, and, and, and have split off from the rest of mammals all the way back in the late Triassic period. All these animals are characterized by having multi-cusp teeth which in some later groups form loafs or ridges like gondwanatheres and fossil monotremes. This idea is not supported by most scientists who view tritiliodontids as just a dead end. But I should highlight that they were successful enough to make it through into the Jurassic as members are found on both sides of the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. So don't knock the tritiliodontids. They were a success. Just maybe not the lineage leading to us, but one that might be ancestral to monotremes if you follow this radical idea. The alternate idea is that all these other multicust groups are actually closely related to this next group I'll talk about. So let's get back to the probathognathids. Um, these are the group that never really went for the whole multi-cusp tooth thing. And rather, they actually kept their cusps on their teeth pretty conservatively with some retaining only three cusps, kind of in a single row of cusps. One family, the Chichiodontidae, were pretty successful during the late Triassic, um, particularly in the Norian age, and they were able to coexist with dinosaurs. But they adapted to dinosaurs by decreasing their body size. In fact, this family is closest in relationship to the group that would become one of the smallest land vertebrates to have ever existed, and they are the Morganucodonts. Morganucodonta is the last thin little string thread leading toward us, and a few are known from the latest age of the Triassic period, the Aradian, from 205 to 200, 200 million years ago. Um, some members of the Morganucodonta from the late Triassic are also placed in the Hyamayid and multituberculate groups, which indicates that the group was fairly diverse just before the end Triassic mass extinction, and that in the modern idea, the multicus teeth evolved multiple times in Hyamayids, possibly multituberculate mammals. In fact, I posted my first video to YouTube talking about this. Uh, you can check out what my old YouTuber said many years ago by checking out the link uh, below. So most of these late Triassic Morganucodonts are known from very scrappy fossils that require years of screen washing and picking through the sediment to find tiny teeth with their series of tiny little cusps. 
And because they appear in the last few years of the Triassic period, they kind of tend to be pretty rare. Most of them have been known from Europe. Now, the key fossil that shows up um, and crosses the Triassic-Jurassic boundary is the tiny shrew-sized mammal Morganucodon. And all paleontologists all agree that this is the first true mammal because it features the denary squamosal articulation of the jaw joint with the articular quadrate contact lost. But the ear is still closely associated with the lower jaw with the tantanic process for the eardrum connected with the lower jaw. Hence the ear was positioned low down against the back of the jaw, a trait seen in early mammal embryo embryos. Now the close association between the ear and the jaw was a great adaptation in itself because these tiny mammals could hear sounds using the jaw to conduct sound waves from the ground and focus them into their ear. Fantastic hearing, which allowed these tiny mammals to quickly evade being eaten by dinosaurs, which by the end of the Triassic had become very agile and swift predators. Rather than trying to outrun them or grow bigger, these animals went all in for stealth by becoming tiny, secretive, and amazing at hide and seek. Now, unlike the Tritiliodontids, they did not have the crushing teeth, but instead they focused on eating insects. A row of tiny cusp teeth all in a line was just fine for cutting through chitin exoskeletons of insects. And there were a lot of insects to feast on, especially when you're so small. They were also likely furry, which helped them retain heat due to their high surface area compared to their body size and had to maintain high body temperatures as both homothermic and endothermic animals or warm bloodedness. Tiny lizards, which appear at this time, they lack fur, but they have amazing body temperature tolerances, indicating warm bloodedness in mammals probably originated sometime earlier, maybe back in the early Triassic, and they had to retain high body temperatures even at these tiny sizes. So I absolutely love the idea that we are descended from Morgadukadon because Morgadukadon did something crazy to be positioned to survive the end Triassic mass extinction by being meek and so tiny. Rather than trying to outcompete dinosaurs, our ancestors figured out how to survive and thrive hidden from view. Being so small and tiny, these new Morgadukdons began diversifying in the Jurassic period, but were never a major component of the fauna. In fact, while the dinosaurs became the largest ever terrestrial animals to have ever existed, the descendants of Morganucodonts, the Eutriconodonts, the Symmetrodonts, the Docodonts, the Dryolestoids, and the Ancestral Therians, they were all rather small, taking advantage of hiding in the underbrush, ultimate experts in hide and seek. So if we return back to the Drake equation, it seems improbable that mammals would later rise to become the intelligent humans that we have today. In fact, throughout the Triassic, the ancestors of mammals were really struggling to find a foothold across both mass extinction events. Early mammals did not have a clear destiny to greatness. In fact, during the Jurassic period, their small size and their humble and lowly traits allowed the group to cling on for millions of years beneath the feet of the dinosaurs. The rarity of intelligent life in the universe, I think is a testament to the very, very special and unique feature of Earth. And that is that you exist. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really had a blast actually doing a lot of research 
um, working on uh, this video. Um, there's two books that I'd recommend um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more. Um, the first book is uh, The Rise and Reign of the Mammals by Steve Bruchette. It just came out, I think, this last year. I've been reading it. Um, a great, uh, uh, interesting in, uh, book. And the other one that I recommend to you is The Beast Before Us. Um, this is a book, uh, The Untold Story of Mammal Evolution, uh, Origins of Mammal Evolution by uh, Elise Pen Sirio. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce her name. And um, both are really good books. So one of the things I like about um, both of them is that they are um, personal sort of um, stories about the scientists that actually study early mammal evolution. Um, so it has kind of a, uh, an adventure story uh, quality to both of these, especially the, the Beast Before Us, which I really enjoyed. Um, so those are two books to check out. Um, both of them have been recently published in the last few years um, and go into a lot more detail than I could in this video if you'd like to learn a little bit more about these groups. Anyway, thanks for watching and uh, take care of yourselves.